Salon. Okay. Okay, welcome, welcome very, very much to Conversations. We have a guest uh, now, a friend of mine and a friend of the universe, that's John Praden. He's a producer and host of a program here at MNN, say the Public Voice Salon. Mm -hmm. uh, he's an intellectual, a la Gertrude Stein uh, and you. company, that had salons where you can be talking about things in a way, a very, a very important educational phenomena within the human society. Mm -hmm. And he's an intellectual, and uh, he's also a supporter of public access. Mm -hmm. And welcome, John. It's so good to have you on the set again. It is a joy and a pleasure to be back, Harold. It's good to talk with you always. And I see now yes. we got up on the stand here yeah. a new book he had. He, he's written a number of books, but Teaching Under the Radar, Confessions of a Secret Agent of Change. You're an agent of change, are you, young man? <laughs> yes. I think we should get you off to the... FBI no. or the NSA. <laughs> you know? No, no. Talk about yourself a little bit. How did you get involved in it? What's your background a little bit? Background. Uh, well, um, starting as a young man, I gravitated towards writing. Right. I wrote my first story at the age of 10. All right. I had some nurturing influences in my family. Yeah, that's important. I had a father who was an actor uh -huh. as a young man, was in a play with Warren Beatty. Wow. Gave uh -huh. up the acting, you know, for to be a family man. Yeah. Uh, but then he got into activism. Uh -huh. So I grew up with an activist father, you know. And, activist, uh, political activist political or social act or? Po Political activist. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and my grandmother was brought to America by a famous actress who was the American Sarah Bernhardt. Wow. And her name was Blanche Walsh. All right, really. And I'm actually making a she movie. She was brought to America from uh, where? Uh, from London. From English. She was born in London at the age of seven. You have an Anglo background? Uh, English, Irish, German, Italian, Dutch, and Hungarian. You're a mongrel. Indeed. European mongrel, there right? There you go. There yeah, you go. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had these creative influences, and my grandmother, who basically was nurtured by this famous actress yes. at the time, who was also part of the birth of the Hollywood star system. Uh -huh. She was a with Adolf Zucker. Uh -huh. She was in his stable there, you know. Right. And, right. and so my grandmother, uh, you, she used to break into song around the house if you know, Wonderful. She knew all the songs from the 1920s, you know. Really? You know, Five Foot Two, Eyes of Blue, yeah. Baby Face, all that stuff. Um, George M. Coy and oh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, it was like growing up in a, in a musical. That's, That's wonderful. My mother my used to play the piano. We, it's so hokey, but yes. they'd play the piano and the family would stand around and sing, you know, yes. George M. Cohen and stuff, you know. Yeah. But it's lovely, really. Wonderful. But it doesn't seem to be happening now. Yeah. yeah but yeah. anyway, yeah. The memories are just so wonderful. And then she had a back porch that was dedicated to all her grandkids as an art gallery. Yeah. So any of her grandkids who made a drawing or, you know, something with magic marker coloring, yeah. you should put it right up. Oh, okay, right so on the refrigerator. Right on the refrigerator. The, and on yeah, the, actually, all the walls, had, yeah. She had a gallery. She yeah, had an right, art gallery right. on her back porch. Mm. So, so with that kind of nurturance, yeah. and then I got a bachelor's degree in English literature from Fordham University, okay, which is a right. few blocks away from here. Yeah, indeed. From the Lincoln Center campus. Uh -huh. And then I got a master's degree in English education from NYU. Okay. To become uh, an English teacher, uh -huh. professor of English. Uh -huh. And at the same time, I, I continued to grow as a writer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I published my first essay in 2003. Okay. And since then, I've published in a variety of essays, mm -hmm. and some of them in, 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 in prominent magazines yeah. and venues like the Brooklyn Rail. Okay. And the yeah. New York Press. Okay. Yes. The New York Press. And also Evergreen Review, which, Evergreen, was, which yeah. was started by Barney Rossett. That goes way back. And it's still in existence. Yeah, it's still yeah. it's online now. A lot of now. serious they writers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I've you know I mean I mean Barney Rossett is one of my heroes. Uh -huh. and he championed Henry Miller and uh -huh. and he got Miller published. He sued the U.S. Tropic government cancer, to get to get yeah to get okay. Miller. He got Miller published and he got D. H. Lawrence published. Wow. Yeah. Right. So that 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 you know so yeah. and uh, and then I went to NYU and I discovered the Village and I got absorbed in a lot of Greenwich Village downtown Would avant garde you yourself a hippie? culture. Uh, a modern Hippie day. Hippie lover. I would say bohemian. Bohemian a, a is modern a little bit day, different. Yeah. Exactly. They used to call them bohemians. In, yeah, right. You know, and, and sort of a renaissance man, I think right. I would call myself you well. know, that. And, and, uh, and got very interested in politics and, and getting involved in progressive circles and uh -huh. churches like Judson Church, which yeah, I discovered. Yeah, it's a great it, place. Great that place. is an incredible it sure ferment, is, yeah. you know, yeah. of, of spirituality, politics, and culture. Yes, in Riverside Church too has a lot of it, even though that's coming from the patricians of the society. Yeah, but there, you know there are places the church has a role for that kind of thing, don't you think? Or the absolutely the religious orders should have a uh, 
concern for the least among us, like most of our sages have said, and ignored by the political class by and large. Mm. But you understand what I'm saying? Well, I belong to an organization called the NSP, What's which that? is the Network of Spiritual Progressives. Okay, that's interesting. This Spell it out a little. A yeah. Network of Spiritual Progressives. Yeah, uh -huh. This was founded in 2006, mm -hmm. co-founded by Michael Lerner. Yeah, Michael Lerner. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. He's a, he's a psychotherapist, yeah, absolutely, a philosopher, and a rabbi, yeah. uh, and also Cornell West. Cornell West was one of the I leading Cornel public West, intellectuals yeah. in our country. Yeah, and they co-founded this network of spiritual progressives. Yeah, he was up uh, West Side here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. I went to a conference at Riverside Church in uh -huh. the year 2000, wow. which was oh. called "Reimagining Politics and Society at the Millennium." Okay. And that was transformative for me. Yeah. And from that event, I got involved with a lot of intellectual activity yeah. in New York City. Uh -huh. There's a group called the Politics for Human Community okay. that meets on a regular basis in diners in downtown New York. Good, yeah. I've been growing with that organization uh -huh. and also with the NSP, the Network of Spiritual Progressives. Yeah. And this now has infused into my teaching. Okay. You've been teaching at what level and where? This, and well, this is the 20th anniversary of my career as an educator. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you very much, 20 years. Thank you. 21. One more year, you can drink beer. There you uh, go. Back in the old days, you had to be 21. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, right. I yeah. started my career as an educator in Hoboken in the public schools uh -huh. as a substitute teacher. Uh -huh. Then I got my master's at NYU in English education. Right. Uh, I taught in three troubled high schools in New York City. Good for you. Each time to replace the regular teacher who quit, yeah. and I had to go in and finish the job. That must have been a tough thing to very, do. Very difficult, very difficult, challenging. Yeah. But it's good to feel needed, you see? That's yeah. what I love about teaching, because you feel like your people there, and there's a, it's a dialogue, Yeah. so you show up. It's if you can get it established, I mean, it's a little hard with discipline and things, as I understand. Now, I don't know. I may be wrong. Well, there's always going to be that, and I think that needs to be addressed, but also the curriculum has to be addressed, I yeah, think. Yeah. And also the whole way of teaching now, it's going in a very corporate direction. You and I were talking about yeah, this earlier, right. you know, that people now are being trained yeah. in schools mm -hmm. to work on what I call the corporate plantation. <laughs> right, right, it's right. That, right. Instead of being educated in the sense of a humanistic education, a liberal yeah. arts, right. learning philosophy and literature, and becoming a critical thinker and being able to engage in the discourse and dialogue. Why do you think that shift is on in well, the world? I, I think it's uh, misguided in many senses. I think it's become overly specialized, as we yeah. talked about. Yeah, you know, okay, that's describing the problem. The question I had really was why? I, I don't know. What, I is, mean, what is the reason I, behind I, this I, shift? I think it's a lack of knowledge. Do you on, think it's cyclical, that there are periods of when you have progressive, as John Dewey, and you had mm -hmm. progressive movements and so forth? And yeah, I, I think I think a lot of it now is because of the over-specialization. I'll give you an example, the business major. The mm. business major is only about 30 years old as something that people that study. True, really? Sure, before Harvard that, business you go back in the day, go back into the 19th century and even to the early 20th century, and the, the, the mark of an educated person mm -hmm. was a humane education. You mm. studied philosophy, you studied literature, and, and, and that kind of thing, and, mm. then, and then you went to business. Yeah. Now, you know, people are educating themselves very narrowly, studying marketing and business, and so that leaves out a lot of real learning that could be taking place. Yeah. So, you know, I think we need to get away from that. Mm -hmm. And I, I took some courses in business as 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 an undergraduate. I know you've Fordham. written you've written on it too. I, I've, 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 okay. This is I'm a business activist. Mm -hmm. You got an entrepreneurial streak, perhaps, or a respect well, for the entrepreneurial I, spirit. I think that money has a place in social change now. I think it has to have, doesn't it? Yeah. And economic theorizing then informs all of that. Yeah. Well, the other side has too much money, Harold. Mm -hmm. The side that's on the side of the oppressors mm -hmm. of the one percent. That's a loaded term, isn't it? Well, but it's okay. Use a loaded term if you want, yeah. Okay. Back in 1934, uh, the DuPonts started an organization called the American Liberty League, okay. which was a think tank, conservative think tank, uh -huh. designed to promote free market ideology. Okay, okay. yeah. It also was very anti-Roosevelt. Uh -huh. They were trying to get rid of Roosevelt because when FDR and that this man. wonderful yeah. documentary on this week that oh you, isn't it great uh, you, the thing that you, Ken Burns uh, God uh, bless him and yeah. you told me about that oh, I want to yeah, thank I've, you for letting I've me know one that this it, yeah. Ken Burns documentary on the Roosevelt <coughs> so FDR comes in in 1930 
32. Mm -hmm. The country is in a deep depression. Right. Something has to be done. <coughs> he raises the taxes on the wealthy up to 90, 92 percent. It held even into the Eisenhower years. It was 92 percent upper income level after the Second War, too. That held yeah. in Republican circles. Yeah, even. Yeah. And the thing, you know, and most of the wealthy elites went along with it because they felt the alternative would have been our country could have went into a socialist direction because you had a lot of activity in the Communist Party and the Socialist Party. So to save capitalism, yeah, right. right he, FDR puts in this social welfare system that moving toward a more humane and caring society. And you did have over the horizon in Moscow the 1917 takeover by the communists mm. in the Soviet Union, which was the groundwork for George Kennan and the thinking of containment and geopolitical thinking mm. for most of the 20th century, right? Uh, Don't you think? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, yeah, that's just yeah. that's part of it, yeah. I got a photograph uh, of myself with George Kennan, Jr. No kidding. Yes, yeah. yes. At some event at the New York Historical Society, there was a, there was a lecture there, and I said, I met George Kennan, Jr., and I yeah. said, boy, this guy, his father was a, was a giant, you know. He was. He was the one who set the whole template you know, geopolitically after the Second War. Yeah. You know, containment and all that, yeah. Before I went to Fordham, I was an undergraduate. I went to a community college. Mm -hmm. in Paramus, New Jersey, right. called Bergen Community College. Mm -hmm. And I took a course in foreign policy, American yeah. foreign policy. Yeah. So I was all over the place intellectually. Yeah. I, I didn't want to study business. I wanted to study something that was going to nurture me. So I took courses in history yeah, yeah, you have a and very, literature. And yeah. I took a course in U.S. foreign policy. You yeah, know? sure. And, uh -huh. But anyway, as far as... Um, Today, you know, we have this situation where the DuPonts founded this American Liberty League, okay. and that set the template mm. for ultra-conservative businessmen okay. to bring money to play to promote their agenda. Well, they were able to do that because uh, you had the robber barons and uh, all that sort of thing that had set up in the 19th century. You had people making enormous wealth, mm. and we have it again, a cycle well, of that going on again now at yes. our time, you know. Yes, because Obama yeah. and company, Geithner and Summers and all that, they saved capitalism from mm. a possible total collapse in 2008. They saved capitalism, much mm. to the chagrin of many leftists who might say, let's get rid of the evil beast or something, mm. but I don't think that's in the cards in terms of the evolution of events on this planet. We want to have a mixed economy. Mm -hmm. uh, government and private sector both wants to be vouchsafed. Now, I think, I'm, uh, it seems mm. to me that's in, an important concept that could be grasped by people who are thinking comprehensively. Yeah. We well, don't want to have an overall control on either just the private sector or the public sector that some people ideologically would like to just get rid of the enemy mm. which they have a dialectic uh, mm. intellectual commitment to seeing mm. if you understand what I'm saying yeah well you know Robert Reich there's a new documentary yeah. about Robert Reich yeah and he he says the uh, inequality of wealth in the 20th century can be compared to a suspension bridge <laughs> yeah. where it was it was at its height the inequality was at its height in 1929 mm -hmm. then it then it got less and less and less mm -hmm. through the 30s and 40s and 50s with mm -hmm. good policy by FDR yeah. having a social contract uh, Paul Krugman calls that the Great Compression. Yeah, okay, we, yeah. There was okay. a lot of money in the middle yeah. in, from the 1930s through the 1960s. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. Very little at the top, not as much at the top, and not as much extreme poverty at the bottom. Right. So you had what, you know, that, yeah. that, now the suspension bridge starts coming back up mm -hmm. in the 70s. Reagan comes in, it even gets even worse, you After know. 80, yeah. What set the stage for Reagan? was to go back to that American Liberty League that mm -hmm. was the DuPonts created that mm -hmm. that that set uh, because America was a very liberal country from yeah. in the 40s and 50s and I think that's one reason people see it as a golden age of nostalgia well for America it yeah. was after the second World War, it was a golden age everything was going up everything yes. was going people became middle class who had been working class yes. stiffs and everything yes. and it was just a golden age and everything went and yes. one of the backbones of that was the was the uh, mortgage mortgage uh, uh, market uh, for particularly homes Yes. And people would get in on the thing. They'd buy a home for five thousand dollars. Sure as get out. Yeah. Five years later, it's worth ten, wow. and so they made five thousand dollars in net worth. That mm -hmm. was the way you got net worth built up for mm -hmm. a long period of time that people became used to, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they forgot the uh, the uh, lessons that had led to the Great Depression back in the nineteen twenties and thirties. Right? It seems to me. Yes. Right? Yeah. I think everyday life was happier in that time. 
because oh, it people, was a golden people, age people for had, the United people States. Had, people had more free time. Yeah. They had more free time. You know, I was on a bus this morning in Hoboken. I was yeah. taking a bus to teach my class, okay. my class at Essex County College in Newark. Okay. I'm a professor, an adjunct professor of English there. Uh -huh. Community college founded in 1968 in the wake of the Newark, I won't call them riots, but I'll call it a rebellion. Yeah, right. The people rose up in rebellion. You had to do something against to, to that do racist that. nonsense that yeah. you've been informing the country for so many centuries. Thank you, mm. thank you. And Amiri Baraka, who was one of my heroes, the uh -huh. great yeah. Leroy Jones. He's a New who, Jersey, yeah. Whose son is the mayor of Newark now, Raz uh -huh. Baraka. Right. Yeah. Right, so continuing that tradition. Yeah, and so you, I, you've got a, you got a foothold in New Jersey. I've got yeah. a foothold. I'm a Hoboken guy. I live yeah. in Hoboken, teaching in Newark mm. now. But the TV show was on the air yeah. in, in New York City yeah, right. uh -huh. and, and around the world. Mm -hmm. So here I am on the, on the 126 bus in Hoboken today, yeah, right. going down Washington Street, the mm -hmm. main street in Hoboken, and everybody's quiet. And everybody's quiet. Everybody's on their way to work, yeah. to the World Trade Center. They go through the PATH train. Yeah. Everybody has suits on, and they have, some, have iPods. Yeah, a lot of, yeah. But the quietness is just very startling, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. So there's a woman sitting next to me, and I just happened to break the silence. I said, <laughs> I said do you notice how quiet the bus yeah. is? You know? And she said, yeah. She said, I guess everybody's tired. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, that's true, I said. And that gave me an opportunity to come back and say, well, yeah, I think a lot of people are overworked today. I think mm. the work week is going up. And, you know, and, and then I mentioned the Roosevelt show. I said I was watching the documentary yeah. on Roosevelt. Yeah, and we they wanted to the put point, in yeah. a 40-hour work week. Yeah. And as we're talking, the guy in front of us, uh -huh. who's a very well-dressed young man in a suit, you mm. know, he turns his head around and he starts to nod his head like about, about, being, the about being overworked, about oh, like oh, how well. we need to have a shorter work week and we were getting into this. And now the three of us were having a dialogue. Yeah. You know, and they wanted my card and let's continue and <laughs> yeah, all you know. right, right. So you can shatter the silence. Yeah, right, it's possible right. to shatter the silences, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. One of the people who used that phrase, shatter the silences, was Maxine Green. I don't know. She okay. was a great philosopher of education. They oh. called her the philosopher queen of Teachers College. Really? She okay. passed away this year at the age of 96. God bless her, yeah. And, and she was my hero. Uh-huh. Okay. And I, I, I would go to salons yeah. in her home. Yeah, right. Her Upper East Side apartment right next to the Guggenheim. Salon's such a great idea, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and absorbing her wisdom and knowledge oh. and of this, this incredible dialogue that she created. Mm -hmm. And she was the... Uh, uh, she was the creator of the Lincoln Center Institute for Arts and Education. So okay. she was a champion of aesthetic education, of yeah. using arts and teaching. Yeah. And she talked a lot about social justice. So I got a lot of my, a lot of my um, spirit and mm -hmm. energy and, and ideology from mm -hmm. people like Maxine Green. It's important to have mentors you like that, isn't it? You have to have mentors. Yeah, Without need, that, Harold, it's nothing. We're losing them, I think, more than we should. Yes. I mean, we need more. We do. I think. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, we have yeah. to have that connection. So anyway, yeah. so here I am on the bus, the silence, okay? Yeah, 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 right. Now I get in, I teach my class. Yeah. It's wonderful. I have a lovely, you know, young people who are, you know, just come out of really bad schools, a lot of them, you know, dysfunctional education system, mm. and they're a room full of 25 young people, uh -huh. and they're black and brown and mm. from different countries and mm. cultures. It's, it's in Newark, New Jersey, so it's a multicultural mix of students. As is New York City and, and, itself. And I love it. I love it. It's yeah. a wonderful mix. Oh. And these poor young people, the only problem is that they're in an education system that's training them, that's not liberating them, that's not helping them to be free, and that's not really teaching the way they should be teaching. Mm -hmm. that's, that's destroying the desire to learn. I think that's what's going on. Again, why? Why I, I, now? I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I we want to try and understand yeah, not only why. the actuality of describing it, but also trying yeah. to get at what's behind and what's causing it and well, what's, the, mm -hmm. what's the game plan for, let's say, if you say activism, uh, at how large a level can we understand what's going on in mm -hmm. evolutionary terms mm -hmm. to able to get an overview of what's happening rather than just condemning the effects of a system that is not in touch with what the future requires for a liberated mm -hmm. as opposed to, let's say, a, uh, a, a, a disastrous world if it falls apart, mm. which now includes, don't forget, in our, our lifetime only, weapons systems, which have been the basis of realpolitik, political legitimacy assumptions throughout all of human history mm. that are, we played a program today with Mr. Makaku, and he said there's no doubt they are, in fact, species lethal. 
Oh. The weapons that exist, I don't know, the Trident submarines alone, perhaps, the fleets, uh, are, have the ability sure. to wipe out the Homo sapien species. That's an existential new reality, is it not? Mm. And I'm so glad. Or that do you do you agree with I that? I agree. I agree with the, what you're the modeling, saying. Yeah. You would repair the modeling and so forth. Uh, I, it's I, not something anybody wants to bring up, but it seems a lot of authoritative people say absolutely that is the case now since about 1970 mm. only. It needs to be. It needs to be talked about a lot more than it is. The yeah. nuclear threat, I think, is is absolutely has. The, I don't see the mainstream politicians addressing this issue. Mm. I don't see the mainstream media addressing this issue. That I believe that we should just get rid of all of them. I mean, if we can, or at least keep a minimum. But worldwide, we have to have a program in place to denuclearize our planet and take us off that trigger alert. And if God forbid these things get into the hands of, of, of terrorist organizations, this, is, this has got to be going on. One good thing I liked about Reagan, and there's a lot you, I could disagree with Ronald Reagan, yeah. but he did at one, he was a cold warrior when he came in, yeah. and then he saw that movie that woke him up, that, that film about the day after. Mm -hmm. And he said, my God, I have to do something. And he went to Reykjavik and met with Gorbachev, and he started to move in that direction. And I think Obama and whatever leadership of presidential or nationwide or worldwide, that has to be uh, addressed. Now, we have the climate march tomorrow, the yeah, People's it, Climate March it and, is and gonna, Sunday. It's going to yeah, be in New York City. Yeah, climate is really coming to the fore now. Very yeah. big. You've got these ice caps up, up in the polar region. Horrible. Now, yeah. if they melt, yeah. you've got the methane gas it's underneath. It's coming already out it of comes Siberia. Out, yeah. It's over. It's yeah. over. Yeah. You know, well, say goodnight, Irene, right? It's, it's over. But... but um, but I don't think, even if that were to occur, and it may. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Even if that were to occur, I don't think it would, it would be of a dimension. It would be a huge political thing, and it would be a huge economic thing, and yes. a dislocation and that. But I don't think that has the ability, in existential terms, to the same, except that it would unleash political anarchy that could lead to the irrationality mm -hmm. of that which would lead to the unleashing of the weapon systems of the United States of America. Mm. That would wipe out the species. I don't think there's anything else that would wipe out the species and uh, end the evolutionary process that has been, in a certain sense, apexed by mankind's conscious evolution. I hope you're right, Harold. No, no, I, I think, do hope I don't you're think right. There would be some survivors, uh -huh. even if they have the... Uh, terrible dislocation, it would lead to political uncertainty. We don't want a political uncertainty or okay. economic uncertainty mm -hmm. that could release the irrational. Mm -hmm. Because you're not talking about anything rational when you're talking about war and so forth. Well, we have an irrational society now. Well, they, they, call, they call what is irrational rational. Mm -hmm. When you have a hyper-capitalistic system mm -hmm. that's inhumane, that's uncaring, where people are overworked, where the United States is now, we, we have... We, one of our guests on our show was Harriet Fraud, who was a psychotherapist. I know that name. She's the wife of Richard, uh, the economist, Richard Wolf. Oh, yes, of course yeah. I know. And Max. She's a wonderful. Max is his son. Max is son very similar. Son is also similar. a psycho, psychotherapist. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and Harriet likes yeah, to say, sure. Harriet likes to say, you know, and I, I, I tell this to my students. I told them that today. Richard that Wolf, yeah. Harriet says, we have five, the United States, we have 5% of the world's population. Yeah. We consume 66% of the psychological medications. So those silent people on the bus, Harold, yeah. they're going to work in jobs that they probably don't like. Uh -huh. They're coming home and they're popping Prozac and doing whatever, you know. Yeah. And I think um, there's a lack of meaning in people's lives. We need mm. to have a shorter work week. Now, I ran for president in the year 2012. You did, and what party? And I don't party? think you know that, because I never told you that. They're gonna, I, was, I like the guy who's got the party say the rent's too damn high party. The rent's I think too damn high. I like, <laughs> I like to, I like, I think he's It's good great. to get a little humor in I, these I, things I, as levity to, you know, lo I, loose the, the You have the, to, you have to do that. You have yeah. to do that. But I, I ran for president uh, to raise consciousness. Okay. And I went around giving out What'd my What did you call flyer. the party? Did you nope, have it was no party. It was you a, didn't it call was, it a name? I didn't give it a name. I didn't have a name. I you just, haven't been to just, a, just you a, haven't been doing PR studies on, uh, on you know Madison Avenue like you should. If well, you're going to launch I, a serious I, business, you got to have a name. Well, no, I'm I just call joke. myself an independent. Oh, I call okay. myself an mm -hmm. independent. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I were to run again, and I probably won't, 
Yeah. But I was watching last night. I was watching the Roosevelt documentary, yeah. and they saw Teddy Teddy Roosevelt. Cool moves. The he ran, and <laughs> yeah. they said, and they he said, and he threw his hat in the ring yeah. again. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and my wife is on the couch, and yeah. she looks at me. Claudia, Claudia. <laughs> Claudia, yeah. Claudia looks yeah. at me like, yeah. are you going to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> I said, I don't think yeah. I'm going to. But anyway, it was a lot of fun, and mm -hmm. I did raise consciousness, mm -hmm. and it was a wonderful experience, you know. Uh -huh. but, but the thing about it is I think we have to think in terms of a possible third party in this okay. country. Okay, uh, bring it up, bring it I, up. If, yeah, I, if I were to give it a name, Harold, I would call it the Humanity Party. I would call it the Humanity Party because it's time to think of our one world as a human race. All right, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and move in that direction towards humanization. Humanization is the core of, of my work. You know, what about the ecology? Well, humanization the ecology, leads to the ecology as well. If you become more humane, obviously you're not going to want to destroy the world because nature is a part of, it's a part of the whole thing, you know. So it's the ecology, the humanity. Mm -hmm. It's getting away from this focus on prop profits, this right. relentless focus on profits. I think that's at the root of a lot of the evil that's going on in the world right yeah. now. A lot of the destructiveness is this relentless quest for profit. And that's why I wrote this book, Teaching Under the Radar, because there's a corporatization process going on in education. And if yeah. you're going to resist that, if you find yourself working in an institution that's very corporatized, and especially at the academy now, mm. where they're bringing in these administrators with degrees in education administration, people yeah. who've never taught before. Yeah. So the, the, the colleges are becoming top heavy with administration, mm -hmm. and they have too much time on their hands, and what do they do? They, they look at teachers and what they're doing and get on top of that. Make another chart. You know, this kind of thing. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. it's really terrible. Uh. So if you find yourself in one of these institutions, you have to, you have to go under, undercover, under the radar, you know. Say one thing in the teacher's meeting, go in your classroom, shut the door, and do what you have to do. But that should Robert not... Robert Williams just died, remember? Robin that? Williams. Captain, my captain. That oh, one, yeah. Dead Poet Society. The Dead Poet Society. Yeah, yeah, that was a, yeah, yeah. yeah. He gave us all a great example yeah. of, of that kind of yeah. outside-the-box radical teaching that's effective, but that very often shakes up an administration that's, that's retro, retrogressive. Uh -huh. Now... The real solution, of course, Harold, is to create new institutions, to create new schools that okay. will genuinely educate and not train. Now, that's going to cost money. And that's why I have a business project. That's why I have an ethical business society. Yeah, you do. I know you've got to focus on that. That's yeah. why I have my real estate license now uh -huh. in New York City. Uh -huh. Okay, And I've pledged 5% of all of my earnings to organizations and institutions that are trying to save democracy and save our planet. Oh. And I've identified right. five types of organizations. Education, so we, big, need, yeah. we, we need big yeah. schools, big time schools. Media, and I'm talking Welcome about- Welcome to MNN. MNN I mean, let's not sell we, MNN in public this, access show because we're but, celebrating that here on this show. This is a good, mm -hmm. Wonderful thing. And, and the autodidact and the exactly, teachers themselves exactly. and links to the internet and the things that are going on. Yeah. It should all be free. The media, yeah. the public should have a voice. Uh, cultural organizations, spiritual organizations, right. people that are doing we need we need magazines and we need book publishing that is progressive and that's not just following the Could you give agenda. me a dictionary or no, yeah. not uh, maybe a more nuanced yeah. thing than dictionary, a, a definition of what it means progressive? Well, it's we're getting been used a, by a number of different people, but it's a big word. And what okay. do we mean when we say the progressive community or the progressive attitude? Well, I think we in should. Your view, I, we should go back and watch that Ken Burns documentary, uh -huh. which is going on this week, where mm -hmm. where Teddy Roosevelt took on the uh, meatpacking industry. The trust. Yeah. That was the trust buster. The trust was, buster. Yeah. Okay, yeah. creating national parks. Mm -hmm. If he didn't do that, yeah. we wouldn't have Yellowstone. We yeah. wouldn't have any of these parks. They yeah, wouldn't yeah. exist. So that's what I mean. That is progressive. Mm -hmm. um, and they had candidate. I mean, and and it, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was getting more radical as. Now, his foreign policy was terrible. I'm mm -hmm. not going to excuse it. I think it was awful. Imperialism, bad news. Mm -hmm. We have to get away from colonialism and imperialism. Mark Twain called him on that, mm -hmm. and he was right. That mm -hmm. was a bad thing. But as far as the economy, as far as that, I think mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt uh, you know, was, was a hero in that sense. So we have to go back to the old progressive movement, revive that. Um, and, and it's got to be, I think, more radical, too. 
more no, radical, more radical uh, yeah. in terms of economic theory, perhaps? <laughs> At the Have roots. you read much economics or not? I, I've read some. I've Keynes. read a little bit of Marx, a little bit of... Uh, Marx, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Marcuse also gets Marcuse into a little bit. Marcuse left, yeah. Marx yeah. and stuff. Uh, you know, and, and this new Piketty, his book well, is, that's is getting a lot of traction. It's getting a lot of traction, but well, it's... You know, it's not getting much traction yeah. in our circles, uh -huh. our citizens. Yeah. But it certainly is, as I understand, uh, also is getting great attraction among the world leadership, the real geopolitical world and economic world leadership, because he's bringing up a, uh, mm. a, 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 a serious thing that's making them look at their assumptions of what's called legitimacy Histor you could even say historical mm. or ontologic or cosmic legitimacy mm. Mm. Uh, with chagrin because they're running up against a real problem of uh, distribution of effective buying power to the people of the world because of the robotization and the cybernation of mm. the productive process undercutting the labor value of the labor input to production. And that's something that the world leadership is concerned about. We have a great productive capability of liberating potentiality for the whole world mm -hmm. and the ecology, yes. but we don't have the means of effectively distributing effective mm -hmm. buying power, money, to the people of the world to clear the market. Mm -hmm. And that's something you're going to have to have major change in order to realize that. And that has to be done in their way of thinking, and it's part of a responsible way, mm -hmm. back to that idea. You don't want to get rid of the private sector or the no, bankers or no, the malefactors of wealth and all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You want you have to keep that, and then you have to have something that also involves the public sector. We got a Democrat Republican Party, mm -hmm. but it's a larger issue that uh, isn't being addressed. As what are the implications of? I would ask, what are the implications of the fact that this apparently is a is a uh, uh, I don't want to say you know facts get to be defined in their own terms to make a point or something, yeah. but the fact of the weapons. One vector of the human society is uh, real politique, real politique. And if you look back through history, it seems to me mm -hmm. it's worth ruminating a little, at least certainly as you think of Western and I think probably world civilization. Machiavelli. Well, Machiavelli yeah. in, in Italy, but I mean, but the whole world, I mean, from Nebuchadnezzar to pharaohs to uh, emperors in China, one would think, and then the political leadership of Rome, the political leadership of the dynastic families, or the political and economic leadership, intellectual leadership of the current, it's always been throughout all of human history a few people at the top. Mm. But the problem now, Harold, is that those few people at the top can destroy the entire planet. Well, that's the thing that's, that's different. That, that's that's only never, within our lifetime. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So as a result of that situation, mm -hmm. we need to transform the situation. Well, that's We need a, a revolutionary consciousness. We need a transformation, and I mean a peaceful revolution, where uh, I, think, I, think, I think that the pendulum has swung too far now to the right. Let's talk about left right. Let's well, talk if you about, want to talk about you know, that, but that's a very, that, away. that's a relative, in my way of thinking, if I suggest, uh -huh. I okay. may be wrong, okay. but I think that's a relatively narrow way of seeing it in terms of the, the, per, the political dialectic is narrow yeah. in terms of systems understanding, mm -hmm. which would be more encompassing of uh, yeah. the universe and larger orders of understanding that do not relate to the political. The political context has been one, mm. you know, you got on the one side labor and you got on the side capital, or mm -hmm. you got extended capability to make products or to make the world different, mm -hmm. which is unique to us. So that's got, what, what, what's, what's the reality and how are you going to do that in a way that keeps both the private sector and the public sector? And what's the reality, the overall reality, or what would be the mm. yin yang, mm -hmm. a, a certain kind of way of thinking philosophically? of the fact that you have weapons, yeah. apparently the modeling can show it very clearly, that are in their capability, mm -hmm. not their actual, yeah. it's not actual, but in their capability, species lethal. Okay, that's, a, that's, a, that's something. What would be an equally significant alteration at the level of capability, mm -hmm. at the level of capability, not the actual reality inherited, with all the, the, the reified institutions out of a historical context being transformed, what would be the equally significant 
alteration in the material world, yeah. putting aside the fact of the idealism and so forth now, but the materialistic world, the real world, that would be equally significant to the fact that we have the ability to destroy this whole evolutionary process that we apex. I mean, in the material sense, mm -hmm. what would be an ontologic reality, a new ontology or a new understanding of the reality at the level of capability? Mm -hmm. My suggestion is, and it never can be mentioned, mm -hmm. we have, at a level of systems thinking, we have, since about 1970, the same time we crossed the line of destruction, we have, at the level of capability, mm -hmm. again, you've got all these outdated institutions and ways of thinking and mm -hmm. reified buildings, architecture, everything. Sure. Uh, but we have transcended at the level of capability projecting into an exponentially increasing capability into the future, transcended at an ontologic level, material scarcity. There is, for the first time, enough mm. on a standard by which you judge haves and have nots mm -hmm. for the entire Homo sapiens species, henceforth, wow. as well as the ecological. We have that capability now mm. and our institutions are not formulated in order to deal with that wow. new kind of a reality so that would encompass yes. the political if yes. you understand what Absolutely. i'm trying to have, reach for and we yes. don't have systems think we had fuller and a few people okay. who were thinking that way maybe yes. chardine okay. or, or, or 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 kurzweil or right, the guy right. wrote the new book abundance oh, yeah. or something yeah. but there's something qualitatively sure. different at the level of capability that can't be mentioned wow. if you understand because they're all caught up within the uh -huh. thinking within the outdated institutions that the future mm. is uh, uh, the, 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 we're not in touch with the future that is uh the means by which all levels of risk and so forth of things that people are concerned with should be considered and up on the table or on the walls of think tanks or in the minds of people mm. all over the world. Can you understand? I do, I do. I mean, I don't understand everything you said. I don't I, either. I think you're a genius, Harold. No, I think I'm not I'm going to have to play this again, and, and under, but I think I get the gist of it. Mm. And I think it has to do with also what Herbert Marcuse okay. was talking about in Eros and Civilization mm -hmm. when he talked about that we're beyond the scarcity now. That Murray Bookshin did, too. Yeah. Murray Bookshin, do you know? Oh, he was no, an anarchist. No. Okay. Yeah, okay, the point. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> let's go back to those silent people on the bus who were trudging yeah, okay. off to work, okay? Yeah. They don't need to be going through that experience. They could be working a, a, a five-hour work day. Or not working, being or, home or, with the or, kids or doing something worthwhile. Yeah. Mm. Communities could be more vibrant and vital and, mm -hmm. you know, this sort of a... Uh, takes a village kind of thing yeah. where people are out in this public square yeah. and there's dialogue and there's life and joy and communities instead mm -hmm. of people just trudging off to work and and I want to know what work is being done in particular in these financial institutions yeah. is that real work or what is happening like with these derivatives and collateralized debt obligations and I think a lot of the of uh, the financial industry is uh, what Les Leopold calls fantasy finance uh -huh. and, yeah. and the insurance industry. Now you're building a case yeah. for the left against the m malefactors of great wealth. Mm -hmm. Can you do it within a way that's going to be not taking that tact, but taking a tact that includes them yeah. as well as us? Hmm. Something well, that's comprehensive. Yeah, yeah. You, you're building a case political sure. against the bad guys. Oh. And that's traditionally what happens in politics. And that's what's going on I, in the Middle East now. And I, I, I do not want to be divisive, Harold. It's not in my nature to be divisive. Okay, I'm, fair. I'm, I'm, I'm a let's all get together guy. Yeah. I, I believe in dialogue. I want to hear people's perspectives and backgrounds. Mm. And I want to go back to this story of all these right-wing think tanks that we have now, right. the Business Roundtable, the U.S. Right. Chamber of Commerce, right. it all emerged, as I started to say earlier, from this American Liberty League founded in 1934. Well, it had been going on since the but beginning of wait, time. Let me finish, Civilized Harold, time. if I can make a point okay. now, if I okay. can make a point. The three DuPont brothers who founded that organization mm -hmm. was Irene, Lamont and Rene, those were the three DuPont brothers who founded that organization. Mm -hmm. Well, Irene was the guy who was the, he was the one, the main guy behind it. He was the most political. Uh -huh. And his daughter married my grandfather's cousin. No kidding. So Very. I'm related by marriage to the DuPonts. So you're one of the, you're one of the families, the malefactors of great wealth and, Just and injustice this in is, the this universe. Is, this is you, a, you have to protect this your is, own interests now, pal, because you're one of the establishment. Wait a minute. This the is, kin of the established. And 
Th this was, is, I'm making a joke. Yeah, there was only one time that that side of the family came up <laughs> north. No, because the family wasn't that close. You yeah. know? And, and uh, my father said, he remembers the story, that yeah. the Cadillac pulled up in front of the house, <laughs> and the Duke, they came out, the, the Bradens. J. Mm. Bruce Braden was my grandfather's cousin. He oh. married Mary Octavia DuPont. Okay. who was the daughter of Irene uh -huh. DuPont. Uh -huh. Irene DuPont founded the American Liberty League. You are in on that class. But I want to be... You're I, the I, enemy, I, I, brother. I'm not the enemy. No, I, you're I, not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I want to I educate. Yeah. I want to educate. Yeah. Now, the thing about this American Liberty League that was bad, I, I didn't like their philosophy, yeah, I don't right. think, but... I respect the fact that they stood up for their values. Mm -hmm. They were businessmen, and they were not afraid to be political. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. I now look at progressive business people, uh, and I say to them, mm -hmm. you have got to put your money where your mouth is, mm -hmm. because the right wing does it. Mm -hmm. They get their money on board, their project. Now, yes, we need to take all big money out of politics. We need to repeal Citizens United. That all has to be done, but I think Stanley Aronowitz says this, and I yeah, agree with him. I, I like he, Stanley. Stanley yeah. says that the left has an allergy to money. They don't uh, want to yeah, talk I think about, probably they, thinkers do, yeah, they, very often, yeah. That's a, bad, that's a bad strategy. They're motivated by the muse. They're not motivated by the greed. So that's why we or have... Or the insecurity of that. You yeah. know, at the top, you have Soros and you have people like that who are the famous ones on the left, okay? Mm -hmm. they, they put their money where their mouth is, you know. But rank and file... We have a lot of business people out there who could be joining together. That's why I created the Ethical Business Society. Okay, to yeah. fight back, uh -huh. to resist, to ameliorate that right-wing hegemony that uh -huh. you see in business now. Uh -huh. A lot of people in business now, they just don't know any better because their education is deficient. They studied narrowly, okay? Uh -huh. So you need somebody at the water cooler to say, hey, you know, this is going on. Come to a meeting over here. Let's mm. go to that cafe. Let's talk about this. Let's get a union going in the white collar crowd wow. because they've never unionized the white collar workers yet. You know, it that's always them. it's a potentiality yeah. though. It's a potentiality. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Marcuse yeah. said that too. He said yeah. the white collars need to get into a union. Mm. But the thing is that uh, so I see myself really as a liberator and as an agent of change. Uh -huh. and, and, well, that's and, what your book says, agent of change. And of a it's a proud term. That was Jesus, I think. You know. I wouldn't, uh, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, oh, it might have been Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, you know, I, I, what I want to do is get out there more with these ideas and mm. get on a stump. You know, well, you're doing and, that and, here, and, and, and maybe we could bring it around to communication because we're at Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Uh, and this is part of an organization of, uh, of citizens who have the ability to do communication the way it's emerging now joining with the internet and mm. the, uh, all the cyber stuff that's coming exponentially into the, f into the fray now and mm. everything. Mm. And it's a, it's a major institutional structure, and uh, you're part of that, and you have a program here that's aired. So this is something where the people, the, the financing of this place mm -hmm. and the financing of the industry or the, 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 the phenomena of public access across the nation, increasingly around the world, is done by payments by the cable industry to uh, these institutions uh, where they have uh, multimedia capability. So all the capital costs and the operating costs, which are things that are all business people, if they're in the private sector or public, what do they have to be concerned about budgeting and be responsible? Mm -hmm. Those things are provided by the cable industry. Uh, they set aside five, uh, the, the template yeah. is they set aside 5% of their net of tax earnings to set up facilities for mm. PEG, public, educational, and governmental. Mm. So in the case of New York, government, uh, about 2% go, as I understand, the office do it, the office of telecommunications uh, and inform uh, here. Uh, the mayor, they get a couple of a 2% or so for city government uh, issues and so on. Then there's about 2% goes for educational, including universities and school systems. And, that, and then 1% is left over for the public. That's where we are now. Mm. So uh, the capital costs and the operating costs, which are sizable. we got a studio here with the equipment ca comparable tremendous, to tremendous. Ken Burns. Yes, or yes. to people who are being sure. creative in that. And they've got it down to where for the producer... For the producer, and this is something that runs against a lot of the grain of thinking, mm. and uh, is that if they want, if they want, 
they can be producing a program. You can say whatever you want. You can say important ideas. You can take important ideas mm. in an autodidact, interesting way and so forth. And you would never mm. have to and have distribution. The program distributes around the world now. Okay? And, uh, you, you, and you would never have to, as far as this is concerned, mm -hmm. think about money. Mm. Do you realize how significant that is? for autodidact uh, individuals of great concern and so forth to be able to produce something for the pure love of the intellectual trying to help improve the human condition if you didn't have to have factored into it the money factor? Well, we, you know, it's obvious that we need a free media. That would be free great. Media. It would be free media. That would be, that's important to have that, you know. And, but, but what's happening now is the corporate media has all the oxygen. They're taking up all the airtime. Well, they, oh, yeah, but this, that's know. something. I'll get yeah. back to Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. It's always been like that. Mm -hmm. It's always been like that. And it, really, realpolitik. Yeah. The way somebody sets up a legitimacy, it's called legitimacy, is that whoever's got the biggest club mm. would go throughout all of human history and hit the other on the tribe, yeah. hit them on the head, and build some army to protect them, and then have the PR and the creation stories to build. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, so it's called, it's not based upon ideology or anything like that or who's right, but you know, it's always be a few people living in the palace and everybody else wallowing around in the mud. I mean, that's the history of the human society. But there's a, a difference between what is and what might be. Well, all right, but right? that's why we were talking about capability. Actuality versus potentiality. Yeah. Mar Marcuse that's talked a, about that's that. That's a biggie. So we're, we're, people think that what is, that this is the rational when it's really irrational, and they think that this is the way things have always been and they're always going to be that way. Sounds like Eric Fromm to me. If, yeah, the same, the same society. Yeah. Yeah. But also, if you go back to slavery in the yeah. 19th century, if people yeah. felt that this was always going to be that way, then we would still have slavery. Yeah, but so, we do have slavery now. Well, it's a corporate slavery. Well, yeah, it's but, a different yeah, but wait a minute. Of, yeah, it yeah. is the same. You've yeah. got a few people running everything. Mm -hmm. And they're responsible for the production increasingly. Yeah. The labor... Uh, I'm from Detroit. Where my granddaddy was a union organizer, and Mr. Ford used to tinker uh, in our family garage when I was eight or he? nine years old before he went on. And when they wow. came out of the farms, yes, yes. Uh, the agricultural revolution, they had to come to Detroit and make those automobiles that got their thing going, you know, mm. and some refrigerators. And they needed those people to turn those nuts. And they needed them in the bureaucracy to check all the boxes on the forms and all that. Mm. All of that kind of thing now. It's not just information technology, it's robotics. Mm. And practically everything within the material world, including the service part of that, bookkeeping and so forth, that can be done algorithmically by automated systems like mm. you write code. So people, in terms of their labor input to production, is being reduced to practically nothing. That's why Pedicchi so uh, uh, is yeah. so important and has the establishment because the only way they distribute income to people is through their, have, uh, by and large, to the mass of the population of the world, is through having a job on the estate where the capital assets contained within the productive process of automation and so forth mm. is all owned by a tiny plutocratic class who are getting overwhelmingly wealthy and all the left can say is, let's get jobs for everybody, because they're, enti they're tied into the labor theory of value. Mm. That it's all this labor. What's so great about laboring? You know, and they got to have an alternate way of distributing capital, mm -hmm. or forming capital, in a business-like way, but they've got to, they can't have the ownership of the means of production all owned by a tiny plutocratic class that is able to take advantage, you make an investment, it'll pay for itself out of its future earnings, and that's limited to those who have some. It's not, there's no way, they gotta get some other way for private sector capital ownership into the hands of everybody as a way of distributing demand to clear the market, and they, they haven't got to that, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's at, at a level. And that real politique thing holds and is reified in all our institutions. Mm. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm ranting, but uh, I think they need something that can be inclusive, and that's something that could appeal and bring in 
the ones who are able to realize the unique quality of the time in which we live it's not another French Revolution or a, a tax bill or mm -hmm. a Republican Democratic or something. It's a time of qualitative transformation. And it's something under which all can be gathering and find mutuality of the way we're going to form capital and distribute demand. And it includes liberation. We can liberate the entire Homo sapiens species and the ecology, or we can annihilate it. Mm. I'm for liberating it. Mm. Amen. Now, where Amen, does the economic brother. theorizing come yeah. that allows us to do that? Because we're still all caught up in the dialect of the bad guys. I just read Tim Geithner's book. He was describing what happened in 2008. It was mm. very well written and mm -hmm. everything is knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. And I think, like Roosevelt, Mr. Obama and the company, they saved capitalism. And is it right to have saved capitalism? Some people on the left would think, get rid of it. It's a mm. nasty organization. But it didn't work well in the Soviet Union to have it all within a nomenclatura. Mm -hmm. So do you understand? We need well, something that can be inclusive of everybody yeah. and get everybody in the tent. And it's lacking because we don't have any comprehensive thinking that gets out of the constraints of the, mm -hmm. uh, the context in which all of history is around us, surrounding us architecturally, intellectually, and otherwise. Mm. And where's the comprehensive thinking coming from? Mm. Maybe public access? Mm -hmm. or from your book or something thank you no well, it's it's a well you know this is a kind of thing that it would take hours to unpack what you know I think I think it, I feel very blessed to be here with you to be having this dialogue I wish more people could be here and be part of it well this is reaching I, out going, this is reaching out. out in high definition uh -huh. to the whole world and okay. I think that's a wonderful thing. And we thing got there. a lot of people here. Yeah. Your, your program's reaching out. Yeah. Josh Verlinchy's right. program. Dean Lawrence's right. program. So a lot of people from here. And others could be here. Okay. And the intellectual leadership could repair to here. Mm -hmm. And the intellect from the universities mm -hmm. and so forth. Yes. There should be a real serious sure. underpinning to this public access thing. And, under, and you could get yeah. the cable industry would begin to find, rather than treating it sort of niggardly, if they would want some of the bean counters, <laughs> they could come to recognize this democratic idea mm -hmm. that is so magnified here in the public access would have real good public relations value to them that is fiduciarily mm -hmm. able to be added to their bottom line and support it fulsomely. Well, if I you understand, public access yeah. is really important. It ought to be supported by everybody of good conscience. I think we need to transform the bottom line of companies now that it should not just be focusing on profits. Mm -hmm. I believe, and I advocate for this with my ethical business society, yes, yes. and a triple P bottom line, people, planet, profits. People, Pe planet, profits. Lay it profit. out a little bit. In yeah, other yeah. words, that yeah. every decision that you make as a company, yeah. you need to take into consideration how is this going to impact the workers, how is it going to impact the community, yeah. and also the natural world. Yeah. Now, yeah. Yeah. W the way it is now, the bottom line is very focused narrowly on profits only. Yeah, right. So we need to evolve in that direction. But I also think, I believe in dialogue. I think oh, the yeah, okay, power of face-to-face -face dialogue, what you've been doing over the years, Harold, 40 years is incredible. I want to applaud you for it. It's, well, it's, it's amazing. The people you've had on your show, the back, you know, I, I was looking at your website and I saw, and sometimes the juxtapositions, you know, I saw Barbara Ehrenreich next to uh, uh, Barry Goldwater, <laughs> the two names on the, on the list. I said, yeah. you couldn't think of more completely opposite people, right? Uh, but you've had all these people. So you create a community here. Try. But the problem, Harold, is that these people aren't talking to each other. Mm -hmm. Well, Barry Goldwater, you know, he's, he's gone. But I think even today... I like Barry. He had a good sense of humor. Do you know what Barry Goldwater mm -hmm. said in the late 70s? He said, why don't they go out and inherit a department store? Somebody is that said. what he said? No, somebody else said it about him. Ba yeah. Barry Goldwater mm -hmm. said, it was in the late 1970s, Barry Goldwater said, we've accomplished all our goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said that. So before Reagan got in, mm -hmm. in his mind, mm -hmm. he, that was as conservative as he wanted to go. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that the right wingers that you see today mm -hmm. that have shut down the democratic well, process. Well, this thing, this, this the, Tea Party the, seems the, just that's a right, Neanderthal. That's crazy. It really is. It that's seems to me it's off just the charts. It's anti-intellectual. It's off the charts. Yeah, yeah. So I belong. It's got to be full. We got to get Obama. Uh, you know, the Democrats uh, some political support. I yes. hope the hell they don't win the Senate and the election coming up. That would be disastrous. I, I, I got up in front of my local city council last week in Hoboken, New Jersey. Good for I, you. I never go to council meetings, but I felt like I wanted to do something. 
and I got up at the microphone, and mm -hmm. what I said was, I wanted, I want them to pass a resolution calling on the repealing of Citizens United. Oh, and well. So cities and towns across yeah. the country, I think 500 so far, have already passed resolutions have calling they really, yeah. on the United States yeah. Congress uh -huh. to pass an amendment uh -huh. that would repeal Citizens United. Yeah, yeah. And they took a vote last week, uh -huh. and all Republicans voted no. Mm -hmm. They voted no. Yeah. So uh, that's something that we have to, and that's where the big money comes in to corrupt the process, you know. And, and, and FDR said, you know, he called this 1%, uh, he called them economic royalists, and he said he, you know, he didn't care if they got mad at him. Yeah. You know, Obama wants everyone to like him and all that. So we have well, uh, to have courageous leadership mm -hmm. at the top. Yeah, but it could be, yeah. You know, and we have to have a movement at the bottom, but you're not going to have a movement if people are not educated properly. So teaching under the radar, yeah. teaching for change. Teaching on public access teaching, cable television. Teaching, educating, on, you and I educating each other right now. Yeah. After, today, after this, I go downtown to Grounded Cafe, which is on Jane Street, and I have my cultural dialogue circle that meets tonight. I created a cultural dialogue circle, good which is for like you. a soiree. Yeah, a la soirees and Stein, salons are a but good idea. off the air. It doesn't yeah. always have to be on Absolutely the air. Absolutely right. Be, I think we need to be talking. But it's good to get it on tape if you can. But you're, you know, you're, and get you're, it distributed. You're, and the possibilities for educating through this media extension yeah. is, is enormous, right? It's, it's incredible. But mm. Harold, you have wonderful parties at your house. You well, have wonderful have gatherings. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes yeah. when people get together and have that kind of discourse, mm -hmm. we need to have more of that. We need to have more everyday discourse. And it has to be structured. I think communities have to have spaces where people can gather and well, share what's going on and mm -hmm. develop their public voices yeah, and I so think that they can articulate this out to a larger... Institutionally, we have 3,000 of these across the country. What I'm saying, institutionally, that's what these public access centers should become. Yeah. Places of real dialogue and real concern uh -huh. and a place for autodidactic learned people with thoughts and so forth sure. to come and have a dialogue that can be shared. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to sing the praises of the institutional structure of uh, cable television, uh, public access cable television, and particularly where we are, MNN. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a very uh, important educational and uh, yes. important institution. We wanted to sing the praises of it. And one of the best things about Manhattan Network is this program is called the Public Salon. Voice Salon. Vo vo public Voice Salon by this young man, uh, John uh, Bra Braden, Braden, and Braden. my wife, Claudia Canesto. And Claudia, thank God for Claudia. You'd be lost without Claudia. <laughs> you wouldn't true. have a chance, you know. <laughs> and uh, we ought to give a, a tip of the hat to her. So thanks amen. for coming in, John. Uh, really nice talking to you. Sorry I got off on a tra tangent. Are but we out of time already? Yeah, we're is out of time. Is this the tyranny of time? time it is the tyranny of time. But my it's goodness. also, yeah, it, time goes fast when you're having fun. Indeed, right? yeah. indeed. Thanks for viewing. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. That's it for now, John. Thanks a lot for all the good work. Give my best to Claudia. Will do, And Harold. the gang in Jersey, okay? Thank you, Harold. Thanks for viewing. We'll be coming back again tomorrow. Thanks one more time. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So I think that just came in. Oh, they're no. running the graphics, so there it is. Okay, so mm. uh, anyway. Uh, Terrific. Th mm. This is going to air Tuesday, brother, next week. Okay, okay. at what time? Let me write uh, it down. 11 a.m., 11 a.m. in New York okay. City. In New York City, okay, yeah. Tuesday 11. Are you on my list? I'll you be get home. programs?